Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Digging Deeper Moment number 82. The mission of our Digging Deeper Moments is to take God's Word to God's world. We're so glad that you joined us. Last week, we saw that the world had become so corrupt and filled with violence by the time of Noah that God decided to destroy the earth with a worldwide flood and begin again. But Noah was a just man. He went against the cultural stream of his day and treated people with justice and righteousness instead of using oppression and violence. Because of this, he found favor in God's eyes. And so God tells Noah that he is going to flood the earth and therefore Noah is to build a giant boat called an ark to save him, his family, and the animals on the earth. Genesis 6.13 says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. You know what gopher wood is? It's like when I was working with my dad. He said, go for this wood and go for that wood. No, it's a certain kind of wood in the biblical days. He says, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The, ark, the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Its width shall be 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. Now, what's interesting about the Genesis account of the flood is that like the creation accounts of Genesis 1 and 2, the story of the Nephilim and the story of the Nephilim giants in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 this story of Noah's flood also steers clear of the myths of the day. Almost every ancient culture has a version of the flood story. It was common knowledge back then. But the biblical account, account is unique in several ways. First, the biblical flood story is unprecedented in that it is based upon the concept of ethical monotheism. Ethical monotheism is the idea that there is one God instead of many, and the ancient world was filled with many gods, and that this one God is moral, that He demands moral behavior from all human beings, and that this God will someday judge human beings according to His universal moral law. Now, in other flood stories, the gods destroyed the world for reasons that had little to do with morality or human evil. For example, in the ancient Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, the gods destroyed mankind because human beings were making too much noise and the gods couldn't sleep. The second difference is seen in the fact that the gods often saved a single person, but it was because the person was handsome or wealthy or was half a god, not because he was more moral than other people. A third difference is seen in that the national gods of the Near East only concerned themselves with their people, unlike the God of the Bible who's concerned about all people. A fourth difference is that the contra in contrast to the gods of the Babylonian flood account who kept the flood a secret so that everyone would be killed, God takes Noah into his confidence so that the human race and the animals of the earth could be saved. And a fifth and very important difference between the story and the scriptures and that found in the ancient cultures is found in verse 18 of chapter 6, which states, God speaking, But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. This is the first time the word covenant is used in the Bible, but it is not the first time that the idea of covenant is mentioned in the Bible. God, had, God established the covenant of marriage in Genesis chapter 2 when He created Eve for Adam and gave her to Adam to be his wife. Marriage is a covenant. Now, the idea of covenant is also seen in Adam's relationship with God at the beginning of creation. Now, while theologians debate whether or not God made a covenant with Adam in the Garden of Eden or not, a strong case can be made that some kind of covenant was made, either between Adam and Eve and between, or between God and creation. And the language of Genesis 6.18 confirms this when it says that God will establish His covenant with Noah. This language is descriptive because when a covenant was first made in the Bible and in that culture, it was said to be cut. They cut a covenant. God does not say that He will cut a covenant here with Noah. He says that He will establish His covenant with Noah. To establish a covenant in Hebrew is different than cutting a covenant. Cutting a covenant, as I said, means starting it, while establishing it means to keep a pre-existing one. God is saying He's going to keep the covenant that He had made. The covenant God will be referring to here is either His covenant with Adam and Eve or His covenant with creation. I've heard it, I've heard it explained both ways. And we'll have to come back to that in a little bit more, de more depth at a later time. But God is, is establishing, He's keeping the covenant that He had made. And so regardless of which way we take it, God tells Noah that he's going to keep his covenant. Now, a covenant is a relationship between two parties built around three things. Kindness, both parties are committing to be kind and merciful to each other. Loyalty, both parties commit to being loyal to each other. And thirdly, helpfulness, whereas really most often the stronger party 
was expected to help the weaker party. And that's, that's what covenants revolved around. Now, when God created the world, He made some kind of covenant either with Adam and Eve or with creation that He would be kind, merciful towards the world, merciful towards not only the people but all the creation. That's why the Bible says in John 3, 16 that God so loved the world. He not only loved us, He loved the whole world. He loves everything that He made. Now, obviously, man is the pinnacle of His creation, as we find in Genesis. And so, ultimately, He's, he's promising and committing to be kind to us. But God is merciful towards us. And this is what's going to play out here in the story of the flood. He's also loyal. God is loyal. He doesn't give up on us. He really doesn't. He hangs in there with us when we're at our worst. He doesn't just stay with us when we're at our best. And finally, He's helpful. He's helpful to humanity. The whole Bible, especially as we get into the New Testament, the New Testament makes it even clearer that God is here to help us. And so God shows His kindness to Noah. He establishes, He fulfills His covenant promise by being kind to Noah and providing Noah with a way to survive the coming flood judgment that was going to come on the earth. Now, God had done a similar thing to Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it says in Genesis 3.15, God speaking of the devil who deceived them, God says in chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity. Remember, Adam and Eve have fallen. They've sinned. Now God comes in and He speaks judgment, but in His speaking of judgment, He speaks of salvation. He says, and I will put enmity, that's make an enemy of, between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent, the devil, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his feet. Theologians call this the proto-evangel. It is the first prophecy in the Bible of the coming of Christ to die on the cross. Jesus would crush the head of the serpent, and in doing so, He would bruise His ankle or be killed. That's what the cross is. Jesus died on the cross. So even in the midst of judgment, in the book of Genesis, God fulfills His covenant promise to Adam and to creation by saying, Hey, you're going you're gonna to go through some rough times. There's things that are going to happen on the earth, but I'm going to save you. I'm going to help you. He shows mercy in the midst of judgment. He shows loyalty in the midst of judgment. He shows helpfulness and promises help for Adam and Eve. Now what we see in both Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve and in Genesis 6.18 with Noah is that God is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps His promises. He keeps His Word. He keeps His promise to be kind, loyal, and helpful. And when we stop to consider this, when we stop to consider that, that the God of creation is kind, loyal, and helpful, we've got to stop and ask ourselves, how bad must the world have been for such a God to come to the point where He had to destroy the entire world and everything in it? Folks, this place must have been a living hell. You know, in my, in my thinking... I picture the world literally like, you know, in Lord of the Rings where, you know, all the smoke, you know, they're, they're going into, was it Mordor, uh, Jonathan? And, you, and it looks like it's all burnt up. You know, that's my picture of what the earth must have looked like at the time. And that might be an exaggeration, but the point is when you, when you really consider the violence that must have been happening for a loving, merciful, long-suffering God to destroy it, things must have really, really been bad. And so what God does is in destroying the earth, He's destroying the wickedness out of the earth, and He's starting over. And His judgment is actually mercy. Because if God had let the world continue on, this hell on earth would have continued and gotten worse. And so what follows the, the destruction of the earth is a new creation. And Noah is a new Adam. And He brings creation back to its original state. And so He starts over, and after it's... The flood is over. God begins again with Noah. In Genesis 1.28, God said to Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And in Genesis 9.1, God says to Noah, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Do you notice it's the same thing? Why? Because God's doing a do-over. The world has gotten so corrupt, God had to clean the slate and start it over again to give us a chance to be able to fulfill the purpose for which He created the earth in the first place, and that is to be sons and daughters of God, that He would have a family, and that the world would become heaven on earth. That really is the big picture of the Bible. And God's plan to have a family, and God's plan for heaven to come to earth will not be thwarted, though the sons of Adam have failed. God began again. And so look, it's really easy, and one of the reasons why I think modern culture kind of rejects this story 
of the flood is they're not looking past the flood to what God's doing. What God's really doing is being merciful so that you and I don't live in a world filled with social injustice, oppression, and evil, and giving the human race an opportunity to start again. In fact, when you read about judgment in the Bible throughout the Scripture, judgment is rarely entirely punitive. It's not, punitive means punishing. God is not punishing the world when He destroys it. He's starting again. He's being merciful. He's correcting. He's making a mid-course correction. And you see these kind of corrections throughout the Scripture where God is really giving us another chance. You know, it's like when you grow up and you get in trouble with your parents, you know, and they, they discipline you at the time. It doesn't feel like it's a good thing. But your parents are really disciplining you because they love you. Because they know if you stay on that track, it's going to destroy your life. And that's really what's happening here in the flood story. And so as we proceed through the, through the Bible, we, re, we, find, we see that the consistent theme throughout from Genesis to Revelation is that God wants a family and that ultimately it's going to be through faith in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ that brings us into this family. And so even though Adam failed, he starts with Noah. Noah, we'll see in later lessons that Noah will fail. And through the whole Old Testament, we come to the place where everybody fails to live the way God wants them to live, except Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, a perfect human being, God in the flesh, offers Himself up for our forgiveness so that we can enter the family of God. So if you have not entered the family of God by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you can do that right now by simply saying, Jesus, I need a Savior, and you're it. And if you do that today, please let us know by contacting us at hello at eaglesnest.ch or calling 302 684-3149. That's see it, contact us at hello at eaglesnest.ch or calling us at 302-684-3149 because we really want to help you as you begin your journey with Christ. If this lesson has helped you, please share it with a friend, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I hope to see you next week when we begin looking at the Tower of Babel. God bless you.